Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. <laughs> Yeah, we've had some really good times, me and you, DF64 version 1. Really good times. I mean, you remember when, when Daddy Hoff called you like the niche killer or made a video about that, but then you kind of didn't kill the niche? Well, I have news for you. If you look just behind me, yeah, there's a lot of competitors on the market now. And I'm going to share that with all these people here. So, I mean, I hope you're okay with it, but if you're not, eh, I don't really care. So if that riveting skit didn't tell you exactly what this video was, I'm going to go ahead and tell you again. Today we're going over all the 64mm grinders I've gotten my hands on. Now there are obviously more out in the market right now, especially on the higher end. You have like the Akaya Orbit and you have the Lagone P64, but I decided I was just going to relegate the really expensive stuff to the Zerno as I think from my experience that it's a little bit better uh, cost value, everything else, but that's my opinion. Anyway, we won't get into that right now because we have a lot of other grinders to go over. Some of the grinders that I've already reviewed, I'm just going to give a brief overview of, but some of the grinders I have not reviewed, I'll give you essentially a full review here. My goal with this video is to give you, the viewer, maybe the uninitiated in the 64 millimeter realm, one place you can come to have a direct comparison between some of the more popular options on the market, as well as some of the less popular options. So without further ado, adieu, let's begin. Oh, hey. We're taking a brief intermission to thank the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. I'm just sitting back here contemplating on how artistic and creative I am and how wonderful it is to be able to share that with you all. So, if you want to be creative and share it with everyone just like I do, all you have to do is go to my link below, www.squarespace.com slash Lance Hedrick, in order to share your creativity with the world. Now, I use Squarespace, which is a great site for entrepreneurs, in order to showcase what you've got going on at home, in your work, in your business, in your passions, in your hobbies. All you got to do is you just take one of these templates that are very intuitive, even a caveman could do it, like myself, take it, you click edit, and you go through and you choose little photos, you put a little thing here, put a little thing there, write a little cutesy note, and you have a fully operational website. And with my code below, you get 10% off of that. You'll be able to grow a community using the blog feature there and respond to your fans. And, and like your mother, my mother is a big fan of mine and she talks to me all the time, my number one fan, it's great. Make sure you use that link below, check it out, build a website, share your love, and we'll get on with this daggum review. So first up, we have two options from DF64. We have the DF64P, P standing for premium, DF64E, E for electronic. These are essentially the same exact grinders, but one has electronic dosing, the other one does not. Electronic dosing is super easy. You have manual in the middle. That's the noise from this, but boom. And then on the sides, you have two pre-programmed timers you can use. To change the timer, you just hold down the button like that and then you can use the two dosing buttons to go up or down, then you save using the hand. Easy as pie. Now, you might be asking, why would you need a timer for a single doser? That's a great question, but it does come with a hopper. So you can toss the hopper on, you can fill it up, you can use the timer. Now, I'm not gonna go too in depth on these because Kyle Rosell has made a video looking at them and I'll link that down below, but I will go into a few things. Some of the key differences and issues I've found with these as, as compared to like its predecessor, the DF64, which I think is now on the fifth iteration. It seems like they come out with a new one every six months. So you have different options for the top, obviously. You have a full hopper, you have this extended hopper that you can use with the bellows like that. So if you want more than that, this uh, little bellows can hold, you have this extender, which looks so great. Kind of looks like that tube that the German kid and Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory gets kind of caught up in. That's kind of fun. But uh, my favorite iteration is you take this off, put this here, and now you have Mega Hopper with bellows, right? <laughs> That's stupid. Don't actually do that. This is not at an angle. It's straight up and down. All right. So with that angle, a lot of people really enjoy the angle because it can help lessen retention. This one is just straight up and down. Oddly enough, they put the cord out to the side, which I think is an, a bad decision, but they did it and it is what it is. The burrs are not as easily accessible. With the original DF, you just screw the top off. This one has two hex screws right here that you got to unscrew to get out. 
Now what you'll notice here immediately is there are no springs for the for the top dialing. So on the original DF64, you would screw the top to dial it in, which would compress springs. This one, the dialing system is completely different. It's right down here on the bottom. So you have this to dial in your coffee. Now the idea with these grinders is to be an espresso specific grinder. So well, you have a lot of range in a smaller range. That sounds really weird, but what I mean is on the original DF, you might have this much room to dial an espresso, right? This one, you have essentially this whole range is, is more so geared towards espresso. So it's not really made to do two different brew types, espresso and filter. You could dedicate this to a filter grinder by recalibrating, or better yet, it's, it's kind of made for espresso. It comes with the typical stock at Tau Mill Burrs, which do a solid job. Um, I believe you can upgrade them uh, when you're buying from uh, Espresso Outlet, but of course, as you know, in the DS, you can put any 64 millimeter burrs, the SSPs or the Gorilla Gears or whatever you might want to put in there. Um, they do fit in here. Now, the issue with changing burrs, and one of the biggest issues with this machine is not even that it's only one brew style focused. The issue is, in order to recalibrate your machine, I'm going to link another video below by Barrett Ellis on how to take this apart. In order to recalibrate the machine, it's a very involved process that a lot of you are not going to want to have to faff around with. Essentially, what you have to do is you take off these little rubber feet, you unscrew it, you take this bottom part off, you got to take some of the wires, you're going to be in the kind of the brain down there, right underneath the motor, you got to unplug some of the wires, and then there's going to be a nut in the center you have to loosen in order to change the location or the orientation of this bad boy right here before you put it all back together. Since burrs are not all the same height, you're going to have to recalibrate with a different burr set, which is just a pain in the bum. Now, if you are someone that strictly does espresso, likes the profile of a towel mill burrs, which are a little bit more traditional in profile, then this, this could be a great option for you, especially at their current price points. Right now, interestingly, the DF64E is cheaper than the P. The retail prices are supposed to be 450 US dollars for the P, 500 for the E, but you have this currently at 325 and this one, the P, currently at 399. The horizontal fixed position of the burrs, you do have a little bit more retention. You are reliant upon those blowers. And of course, there are, no, there are notorious issues with the chute and the declumper in these grinders. Granted, they are getting better with each iteration, but there still have been many issues that have been reported online of a blocked chute or a declumper issue. Uh, there are aftermarket declumpers and shoots you can buy uh, in order to make it better. But just so you're aware, there are those issues. At the price point currently, especially 325 for this one, even though I'm not a big fan of having electronics and uh, like an electronic interface, at 325, that is a really nice bargain, again, for a singular focused brew method, espresso. Like if you, if you have this dialed into espresso down here, calibrated to espresso, at the coarsest setting, you're only going to really be able to get like a really fine grind for a pour over, it's gonna give you a muddy bed. It'll probably taste similar to a niche pour over, which is not ideal. Kyle has more information in his video, like for instance, he says he was testing out the timer function and that it oscillated plus or minus one and a half grams. So that not, might not be the best option. Timers are never really that great on grinders, um, especially ones that have this kind of retention issue. So it's spinning out uh, oscillating amounts every time. So the hopper may not be the greatest option for you. And when you're paying these prices, you're gonna have to make some sacrifices and that is one of the, the sacrifices there. With every update of their grinder, they seem to iron out some kinks, but they also seem to introduce other kinks, like on this bottom way of dialing in. This top one, the threads, whenever you're removing it, because it's like a cheap aluminum, a lot of times people would warp their threads or would cross thread it or would have issues where it was grinding down. And so uh, because of that cheap aluminum style threading system, this might be a preferred way of doing it. Granted, using this type of dial system does move the whole motor as well as the bottom burr, as opposed to the top burr with springs. It is a little bit better of a system. So if you're wanting something stock that's going to do espresso and you don't feel like messing around with burst swaps, this is a solid option and one that I do recommend uh, it, as long as you're aware that it's not going to be able to produce both espresso and filter, as long as you're aware that the calibration process is very annoying and sometimes they can come not very well calibrated. Alignment on this is fair. I mean, it's it's about as good as you can ask for from something this cheap, but that's not saying they're all going to be aligned out of the box. It is a bulkier piece because it only has the two screws to really hold it down. It, you know, it, it's 
it's just going to cause a little bit of issue with alignment. But again, if you're doing traditional style shots, it shouldn't be that big of an issue for you. Lastly, I just want to note that with these wood accents, which look really nice, they do have a lot of imperfections. Mine came with this massive scuff mark right here, uh, which is not the most beautiful thing ever. Ugo asked me actually if I had a fit of rage and threw a temper tantrum and tossed this on the ground, which isn't beyond me, but not in this case. It showed up like this. So there are some scuff marks and things that are going to come uh, with these grinders. I mean, again, the price point, you're kind of paying for that. So if you're looking for something in this range, I actually really like the P, the E. I'm not big on the electronic doser, but for the 325, you can save 75 bucks. You know, it might be worth just having that little hand that you're touching. But uh, anyway, the noise is not that bad. It is whenever this thing is vibrating. Oh, that one's not plugged in, Lance. Come on. But the noise isn't that bad. Obviously, when it's off, it's not very bad. When it's on, it's similar to the DF64. Um, so again, you can watch Kyle's video for any more on that, but we're gonna go ahead and move on. <laughs> Next up, we have the newly released DF64V, V standing for variable speed. I mean, they've got so many grinders now, it's good they're putting letters so that we can kind of remember. But anyway, oh, I thought that was funny. What I'm gonna do for this one is I'm gonna link the Coffee Chronicler's review down below. It's a good 20 minute review where he goes through it, but we will hit some of the biggies right now. The DF series has been known for having issues with the shoot clogging up and having those issues and taking the shoot off is kind of a pain in the bum, especially with the original DFs. Uh, what they've done here is given an magnetic shoot. So it's a two-piece shoot that just clips on with a couple of magnets, which I think is a really nice touch. If you run into some sort of uh, some sort of jam, you can just take this off, take a brush, and you're good to go. Take a little blower, boop, boop, and you can poof it out. And you can actually see the declumper right here, this little window. And look, there's some grounds caught behind it. Shocker. There is some retention. That's why it comes with bellows. Bang, 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 ba bang, ba bang, 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 bang. Look at all those lovely finds. We also have this new style of dosing cup where we don't have forks here, but we have this little wooden stand, which likely will get coffee oils all over that, but it might, you know, it might give you a little rug and make you look like you're a an aficionado. This sits right here, so you can dump directly into the cup. Now this cup is a little bit less than 58 mils, so if we put it into a 58 mil porta filter, there's a little bit of wiggle room, but it goes straight in, and if you're using a funnel, it makes it all the easier. Porta filter forks, there are none, obviously. There's not even a place to screw them in, so if you're someone that likes to use the porta filter forks on some of the other other series, this doesn't have that. I'm not a big fan of going straight into the porta filter. I don't know why, honestly, but I, I just, I'm not a big fan of it. I know for some of you that is a big part of your workflow, so this does not have that. What it does have, however, is variable speed. So as you see right here on the side, there is an LCD screen. When I go to the left, we go down in RPM. It goes down to 600. When I go right, tick, 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 it goes all the way up to 1800 RPM. So 600 to 1800, which is not, a, that's, that's a pretty good range for something like this. If you're wondering about the accuracy of the RPM, Tom Poland on his YouTube has put a video where he uses a, a strobe light essentially that can read the RPM. Uh, I usually use a tachometer, but his this strobe light meter seems to work really well. Every position, tends to be right on the money. So with this, they actually introduced, for the first time in the DF series, a brushless DC motor. It's not that big of a deal if you have an AC or a brushless DC or a brush DC. The biggest difference is, is if you have brushed, you might need to change the brushes at some point in the lifespan. The brushless, obviously, you don't have to do that. And then you also have to have a controller board with these brushless DCs. On the first run of these, they had an improper uh, board, essentially, so a controller for this grinder, and it was causing loads of stalls. And when I say loads, I mean loads. I was even putting dark roast in there at espresso grind and it was stalling and I think this is because the people making these tend to use really 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 dark roasted coffees in their testing and probably for them the board was fine they weren't experiencing stalling well on their first release there was a lot of issues so they've sent out replacement boards I actually got a second whole new unit um, with the new board in it and with this one I've yet to actually stall it using even really incredibly lightly roasted coffees even at 600 rpm I know that the coffee chronicle said he experienced stalling I'm curious if he has the new board or not, but for me, in my house, I have not experienced stalling yet on this new one, even with the super lightly roasted coffees that I have, which I have some really lightly roasted ones, even at cold starts. So the motor, it was never an issue, even with stalls. So if you have a, a grinder that stalls, it's likely not the motor's fault. It's likely, if it's a brushless DC, it's likely the controller's fault. Uh, sometimes people are a little too safe in order to safeguard the motor. Let that motor speak a bit, you know what I mean? Much smaller than the original DF, and you have a, an easy button on the side that gets it out. 
There seems to be a lot of retention there. I must not have bellowed very well. But um, very quiet. That was one of the big reasons they went to the brushless. Very, very quiet if you listen. That's 1800 RPM. That's 600. Can't really hear it, right? We'll put some coffee through it so you can get a better idea. We're at, yeah, we're at a fine, we're at a really fine range. This is espresso range. We're gonna just dump some of this. This is Nomad's test roasting. They're kind enough to send me test roast so that I can test. We'll do cold start. So this is really lightly roasted, very dense beans. We're gonna go ahead and put the top on to help with the sound a bit, because this is more real life. And then we'll go, we'll do 600 RPM. And here we go. I thought I'd stalled it for the first time on camera, but I didn't. It's obviously much harder at a cold start to get that spinning started, but even that, it was able to get it up. Now we're gonna watch. This is at 600 RPM, mind you, but it's still pushing out grounds. That clump, that declumper is pretty stiff, so it's gonna take some time to get it all out. An easy thing to do is at the end, you can yeet up the speed to get the rest out. There we go. Now we can see how much is left with bellows. There's a little bit. So that's without RDT. You know, there's still fines in there that we can, we can bang out fines for a while. So it's a very quiet grinder. Absolutely love the quietness of this grinder. It's incredible. First off, this is new. The, this is a little anti-popcorn device that has a gasket, so it just sits using the pressure of the gasket. Ooh, you know, I, I can hear music in anything, right? I just need Charlie Puth here to tell me the pitch. Okay, fits in there with a the gasket, which is really nice. So it feeds right in, boom. Coffee Chronicler likes to use no uh, bellows, so it's a little bit prettier, it does look prettier, and he just kind of taps with his hand. And if you can cover that whole thing with your palm, it gives enough force to really get out a lot of that retention. You're not dialing in with this main piece like you do on the DF. Instead, you dial with this, which is a nice touch. This has a little marker on it. As you turn it, it changes the number, all right? So you're changing the top. Now, one of the issues with that is that when it gets around to the back, it's a little bit more difficult to see what number you're at, but thankfully it's at an angle, so it makes it a little easier. Something like the P100 is flat. It's horizontally mounted, not tilted, so it's impossible to see them on the back. This, because it's a lot shorter and is at an angle, it's a little bit easier. Now with this, you have the upper burr carrier that's mounted in between these little rubber gaskets, which will further help with the deafening of sound. So the vibrations are kind of absorbed into those little rubber feet. Then of course we have the bearing up top to turn the top piece. Whee! And then you just kind of pull out that top burr. As opposed to three individual springs, is they're using what's called a wave spring. Music everywhere. Not the same pitch as the other. Compresses all together at once and goes back up. So whenever you're putting the burr back in, it do, it's not as reliant on the orientation as it previously was. And the wave springs just last a little longer. I think that they're a better um, option for this, which they also now have in the DF83. This is not the normal Ital Mill burr that comes in the DF64s like we saw on the E and the P. This is the new DLC coated burr. It actually has a similar geometry to like the Gorilla Gear burrs. To give you an idea, <gasps> Wow, first try, that's incredible. Both have DLC coating. I think they're very similar in taste profile. If you're someone that enjoys the types of coffee that bring out, you know, a decent amount of clarity, but kind of focus on body and sweetness, this is a really good option for you. They do well on pour overs as well. They're a good multi-purpose style burr. Uh, they're not the greatest in the world, but they're they're really nice. Uh, and so if you're someone that's looking for a good grinder that's compact, it's very quiet, it has the variable RPM feature, well, this is, this is a pretty solid one. And the fact that the chute is removable and you can get to that really easily is great for when you're switching out coffees, you wanna clean that chute, whatever it is. And the fact that it's a screw on, you don't need tools in order to access the burrs is a really nice touch. 599 US dollars, that's the current price. I think it's a really solid and, and, and seductive type of buy. You have also the Time War 064S, which I'll look at here in a bit, but those are kind of, in my opinion, the two that are kind of battling it out. So it's, if you're looking for this, you might be looking at the Time War, who knows which one should you get? We'll talk about that in just a second. I do need to mention one thing about this grinder that doesn't get enough attention, and that is the brush that comes with it. Now, I absolutely adore a good brush because I'm using it all the time, right? I don't know who makes them, but it is the best. I would consider wearing makeup just to use this as my face brush. It's glorious. And actually, a friend of mine has to borrow one and has ended up stealing two, and I'm a little peeved. I love them, I love them. I don't have a dang shirt pocket, but it is what it is. I love them. 
Now this one you might sort of recognize because it has a similar body and shape to what I reviewed earlier called the SD40, which is a conical burr uh, grinder. Now those are also sold by Espresso Outlet, the Turin SD40, but they're sold in other places as well. Interestingly, that company that makes the SD40 makes a 64 millimeter flat burr grinder. The company that actually makes all those grinders is called iTop. So this is the iTop 64. I found it on AliExpress and was, you know, I was curious because I enjoyed the SD40 and I think it has a nice build quality. And this one is no exception. It has a similar dialing system to the SD40, but it's stepless, which is nice. You just kind of turn this little guy right here. So it's a stepless aluminum dial, which feels good in the hand. Now the font on it's not great, but I'm not here to, to bicker about that. I'm not Saint Hoff. It has bellows built in, just like you would imagine, because this still has some retention to be expected. Something that's interesting is their decision for a dosing cup. They made this little like magnetic thing that has pins in it that sticks there. And, uh, and then they have this cup. I don't know, I don't really get why they had the stack in thing, but I do like this, this texture on the dosing cup. I think it's unique uh, and it's magnetized onto the bottom, but because this bottom is like a foam material, it doesn't self-center, it just helps stay in place. Now this grinder is multi-purpose in that it can do both espresso all the way up to pour over. Very nicely, they actually in include with the purchase the two Allen wrench sizes that you need for taking this apart, which I think is a really nice addition. So this is what is so interesting about this grinder. Blind burrs. Now these look identical to the 64 millimeter SSP multi-purpose burrs. You know, I'm not saying they copied, but it's pretty dang similar. This is the 58 brewing burr from SSP, but it's like the same geometry as the 64. And I mean, look at that. It's identical, except for the fact that this is blind, has no screw holes. So it opens up the surface area a bit more, uh, arguably gives you better particle distribution, uh, and it's something that SSP now makes. But this I got like six or eight months ago and it already had these blinds in here. Now that is exciting because I do think the world of grinders needs to turn to all blind burrs. But the issue is, is they didn't have good foresight when they made these. The screw distance is not the same as a typical 64 millimeter uh, burr. If it was, you'd be able to use screwed burrs in this. You just, you screw in the burr from the backside. If it was the same distance, you'd be able to screw and from the front side. Now the Zerno, on the other hand, which we'll look at in a second, they do, they are compatible with the new blind SSP bur uh, burrs, but they have them at the same hole spacing so you can screw from the front or the back, it doesn't matter. And that's gonna open up a plethora of other types of burrs in there. They kind of shot themselves in the foot, in my opinion, in order to take over a market of people who are you know crazy about burrs. I think this is a really well-built grinder with a more than robust motor to last a while. It comes from a company that I think has proven itself with the SD40 and it has, nice burrs in it. These burrs are actually pretty good. I think they suffer a little bit in the finish. They don't maybe has a, have as much pronunciation as the SSP ones, and that might be because of the quality of the cuts or something like that, but they are a very good burr set, much better than any of the other stock burrs you see on these competing grinders. I got this for 350 bucks on AliExpress, and it already comes with these burrs. Most of these other grinders, in order to get burrs like this, you have to pay an extra $200. So if you get the DF64E, for instance, and you want all a Espresso, then you'd pay the 325 plus 200 for SSPs. It's like 525. This you're getting with, granted they're knockoff uh, SSPs, but they're blind burrs with a similar profile at uh, 350 bucks. There is a decent amount of retention, th therefore you need to use the bellows in RDT. It is a little loud, but you have decent granularity on dialing in. It's not the most massive area for dialing in that you might want. And these burrs, you know, do tend to make it a little bit more difficult to make espresso. So you'll need to be really, really fine when you're grinding lighter roasted coffee. If I didn't want to faff around replacing burrs or anything like that, this is actually something I would consider getting just to use with these base burrs. There may be other burr options. I'd have to imagine there are. I just haven't seen them. You can buy iTop and rebrand it and resell it. I know that ACS uses these, the, the Notorious Lever Company, and I can't imagine that they're using these burrs for the style shots they produce. My imagination tells me there are probably other blind burr geometries that this company offers. You just gotta kinda go looking. Uh, but with this burr set, I think it's great. I'm a big fan. At 350 bucks, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to really complain with the robust build, how heavy it is, uh, and, and it looks pretty decent. I'm not a big fan of this wood choice on the top, but maybe you can switch it out. You know, maybe you could paint it black or something. Burlock is right here, so we're gonna go, we're gonna go pretty fine. We're in the espresso range, just so you can get a good idea of how loud it is. So we're gonna turn it on. It's not, it's not quiet, it's not quiet. Okay.
So it does have kind of that shrill pitch, but again, the multi-purpose burrs, which these are not from SSP, but those types of burrs, there's a decent amount of retention. Um, I'm having to bellow it all out. But those types of burrs do tend to make a lot of noise on almost any grinder you put them in. The RPM of this is right at 1400 and it has a 250 watt uh, AC motor, which is more than adequate for something at home. Uh, it'll last, you know, probably longer than you'll be using it, as long as some of the other components don't break. I don't think the motor will ever have an issue. So anyway, this is the iTop 64, sits so about 350 bucks on AliExpress at least the way I found it and bought it. Yeah, let's move on to the next one. Next up is not the Legome P64. This is actually the G64, and it cost about 850 US dollars. Now I've had a lot of people over the months ask me to review this, and I got one, and to be honest with you, it is um, very underwhelming on top of being an almost identical copy of the Legome P64 as far as aesthetics go. They go away you know, with this little oddly large circular base right here, but everything else looks quite similar. This is how you turn it on and off, is with this awful touch screen that I absolutely abhor. So you hold down the power button for a long time, there you go, now it's like on, right? And then to, to run it, you just click this. Not a great noise, wait till you hear beans in it. And then there is variable RPM, so it goes from one, to seven. So the RPM goes down to like 800 and up to like 2200 or something like that. I took my tachometer to it, I can't remember exact, and it was a while ago. I've had this for at least six months, if not longer. I mean, anyway. There is three screws here in order to take the burr carrier off, which we'll do here in just a second. And then you have the dialing, which is just twisting this top piece here. Dialing does not feel great. It feels like metal against metal almost. It's not a very good feeling. Maybe it just needs more like food safe grease on the inside or something, but it doesn't feel great. This piece is removable. There goes one of the magnets. The magnet fell in here, which is not a good thing because guess what? The magnet is metal and it wants to stick to that stuff. So it would suck if you didn't notice that and ground that and just absolutely destroyed your grinder. These little magnets sit in here for the top piece like so. There's that pesky magnet. You see we have the top bird carrier that's held down by four springs. That's what you're compressing against when you dial in by turning the top. And there we have the burr. So the burr is very similar geometry to the, uh, it, I believe it's identical to the uh, Italmil DLC coating that are in the DF64V. So this is just a titanium version. It does a decent job. These burrs, however, are incredibly loud in this grinder. When you switch out and put like SSPHU, it's not as loud, but I'm about to show you how loud it gets here in a second. Now this burr carrier has a lot of weight. It's, you know, it's built pretty well. I'm not sure of the tolerances on it, but I think it does a pretty good job um, of holding that burr there. And it has this nice gasket here, which uh, disallows coffee grounds from going up and making too much of a mess. And of course we have the top bearing here, which is what helps give you that sm uh, a more smooth kind of spin. Although, like I said, I think it kind of feels like metal on metal. They're a solid burr set, just like on the DS64V, but you give away a lot in the process, like a ridiculously sounding uh, grinder with these burrs in there. Again, you can swap and have something different, but then you're over a thousand bucks and it's like, why not go for something else? Uh, because this is 850 retail. If you buy extra burrs, it's another 200 bucks. Huge flaw on this that I absolutely abhor, and I hope it's just my unit, but I doubt it, is this catch cup. It gets like stuck in there, and it's it just chews the edges completely all to bits. Fits inside the 58 perfectly, which is nice, but the little phalanges on it really suck. They leave a lot to be desired. So when you see, when you get it on here, you get it clicked in and you're grinding, which you would need to have a collar on it anyway, a funnel, or it'd go everywhere. Taking it out is a pain in the behind. Now real quick, as I'm plugging it in, this is another irk of mine, but this little piece is really wobbly. And again, it might just be my unit, but anyway. All right, let's get some grinding going. Gotta turn it back on. Look at imaginary watch. Oh, there it goes. We'll go setting four. It should be about, you know, 1500 or so RPM. Actually, we'll go setting three and go. Here at Bird Chirp, sorry about that. Yikes. All right, so we're fine, but we won't be that fine. Here we go, setting three. It's still shooting out, okay. Now that's done grinding, let's throw a bellows on top. It doesn't come with one, which is a downside, but let's see how much comes out when we toss this little bellows on top and... 
Okay, so not a ton. There we go. We moved it up to seven speed, so a little over 2,000. There was more that came out. So with this, you definitely want some sort of bellows, but it doesn't. it's not really accepting of bellows. It doesn't like the bellows because of the way it feeds in with that little decline. Unless they are making a ton of improvements, I just don't see, I don't see the point. I don't. But anyway, let's go to the next grinder. Next up, we have the highly anticipated Kopi Diva. This grinder started to make its rounds on social media back in 20, early 2021, and I was actually sent an early, early prototype review unit back in March or April of 2021. There are a lot of issues to iron out back then, and they've done a good job of getting a lot of that done. Now, the creator of this grinder is a guy named Brandon, who actually is an F1 engineer. For <laughs> Oh my God, Ugo loves F1. During pandemic, he wanted to create a grinder that he didn't see on the market. Even though it has a BLDC motor that is rated up to a thousand watts, it is battery powered. It's got a really efficient system there, but of course being battery powered, then you have to think about maybe changing the battery at some point. You plug it in to charge it up, and then once it's charged, it stays charged with a daily use of multiple shots for like 40 days. I've had this now for a while and still I'm on my initial charge. So on the back, you flick the switch. It's a similar switch to on the niche. And then this shows you where your battery power is at. Out of four lights, there's three lit up, meaning it's essentially 75% full battery. And then to start the grinder, all you do is you hit this little button on the side, and there it goes. Now you may have noticed on this side there was a knob. That's for variable RPM control. This actually goes all the way down to 200 RPM and all the way up to 1200 RPM, which is really impressive. Not many grinders go that low. All I can really think of is maybe like the Kofatec Monolith. So instead of having like an LCD display on the RPM, they opted for little notches that are correspond to the RPM. So it starts at zero. So you can turn this on and have it not even run. Then it goes to two, which is 200 and three, which is 300, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, like so. So it's very silent. They opted for the brushless DC to make sure it was a really silent grinder. Now what's interesting here is they actually have one of the main design pieces up here is actually covering the, the pulley system, the belt system up top. And you can see right there, the system. So it's this pulley that is making the burr spin. It looks like there's a wobble to it, but that's probably just the placement of the nut. See that right there? So that's right at 200 RPM. I saw on Home Barista, someone took a dial indicator to the actual shaft going onto the burr and we're measuring it and it was within 0.05 millimeter tolerance. They actually have a patent pending technology to give partial alignment, which we'll go over here in a bit. But I thought this was kind of neat that this is just up top. If you ever have an issue, it's very easily accessible and the cover is actually a really nice design choice. So we're gonna put this back on. This, like the previous grinder, runs at 850 US dollars. They did a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo, whichever one they did, um, a few years back and they started delivering them last year. I'm not sure what the Kickstarter price was. I think it was like $500 or $600, but it now sits at a price of $850 US dollars. Of course, if you want something other than the super jolly Mazer style birds that are in here, do a good job for traditional coffees, but are not great for the, you know, the light roast aficionados out there. You'll have to pay extra for those SSPs. The way that this funnel is held on is just by a gasket. So you just apply some pressure pulling down. Woo! It holds on pretty well right there. And then what you immediately see, this little flap here and this little flap here. Now the idea of that is as that lower burr carrier is spinning, it can wipe off the grounds that might get stuck to the interior of the wall. Of course there is some, you know, so there's some still in there, uh, but it does a pretty good job of that. And these are just simple little zip ties that you can buy a pack of for a buck 50, and then you can replace them if they ever get mangled or worn out or anything like that. So that's actually kind of nice. But I was talking earlier about what their patent pending technology is actually just a piece of copper that they use in order to give partial alignment. Where the birds are sitting exactly in line with one another. I'm not talking about vertical alignment, but horizontal alignment. They have this piece of copper that holds them side by side. So that is a, a, nice, a nice thing there. So when it comes out of the box, it's pretty well aligned. You might need to go shim it in order to get perfect vertical alignment, but that, that's all there is to it. To take the bird off, all you have to get is the key that matches this middle bolt on the bottom. And this does not loosen up even after lots of grinding. So if you're worried about it loosening, it's not going to. And then you just pull off the bottom burr. And there you have those Mauser burrs. And then of course you can flip this one upside down to just unscrew and switch. If I put the burr back on and you'll be able to see how it kind of spins right here. So there we are. That's the fastest RPM. 
and here's down to 200. Flick, 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 flick. I'm so brave. Now you might be asking, okay, Lance, but how do you dial this bad boy? Well, it's as simple as this. This little screw right here, you loosen it in order to make the dial loose. And all you do for the dial is you twist the whole head, the whole barrel right here. This is how you make it looser and coarser. Going this way makes it finer, this way makes it coarser. The dialing is annoying because it's on a, an angle, the numbers are. So in order to see, especially if you're tall like me, you have to kind of like bend down in order to see the numbers which are on a down slant. And then the ticks are right here underneath the lip of this. So standing upright, I cannot see it unless I get about this far away. Then I can start seeing the ticks. Now I can start seeing the numbers. So in order to dial, I mean, you're gonna, it's gonna be up close and personal. You gotta get up like this, line up with the line here. All right, that's where I want it. Then you twist it in really tightly. If you don't screw that in tightly, it will drift as you're grinding, which is very annoying. So screw it in very tightly. On some earlier iterations, they had issues of it drifting even when it was tight. Um, it should be fixed now. Mine hasn't had that issue. I just read that on some forums. You have to do some tricks in order to get low retention. Uh, and because the way the hopper is, you can't really fit a bellows in there. So the hopper is actually right here. It's this little sliding trap door, okay? which actually feels really nice. The front is lined up really nicely and it, it kind of hides into the side really well. Then in order to get beans into this small little one and a half centimeter aperture, you have to use this dosing funnel that they give you uh, when you order your grinder. You can squirt it with RDT, which they recommend, shake it up, and then you feed it in using this. You essentially have to use something like this because pouring from a dose cup in there, they spill everywhere. I understand it from a design perspective and from how it works, but it limits you on using bellows and you can't use just any dose cup. You have to keep up with this. You can use something like this for your bellows. Turn it on, you put it in, you can just blow like so. But that's about your only option. Hitting it doesn't really do much because how solid and sturdy this is. I mean, this thing weighs a good bit and it's built really well, as you can imagine, from someone whose background is F1 racing. Oh my God. Comes with your catch cup. Supposedly it comes with a stand for the catch cup. If I had one, I have definitely lost it. Uh, but let's imagine there's a stand as well, which I think would be necessary because these can throw grounds everywhere. And they all come with your dosing little shovel. Now you can upgrade and get the espresso setup, but I do not recommend that. I don't really enjoy this, to be honest with you. You do have this little flathead screw here that allows you to raise or lower the height for this neck. But the issue is when you put something in it, like, like this split shot portafilter, it's very unstable. Okay, so if you're using a split shot, it's it's kind of dangerous, honestly. If you have your grinder near the edge of the table and you put the split shot in, first of all, you have to pull this out in order to get it in, and then it could just fall and hit your toe if you bump into it at all. Like with standard portafilters, like what comes with the Lelite, fits nicely. No worries, and they give you this little collar, and there you go. It's good to go straight into the portafilter. I don't know, I think you can probably jimmy one yourself at home that does a better job. Um, I'm just not a huge fan of it. I wanna show you what it looks like grinding. Of course, this is with the stock burrs, and so just know with the multi-purpose burrs from SSP, it takes like three times longer to grind. It takes a lot longer. The motor is more than capable to handle whatever burrs you throw in this, because it is a robust motor, and they've done a good job on controlling it. All right, so we're gonna do 20 grams. Perfect, 20.04, <laughs> 800 RPM, and we're gonna time how long this takes, all right? And I will go in RDT because that's what they recommend. So hot start it, boom, then we feed it in. Well, actually, set the timer. Gotta hold it up here. So whatever stand they give you is definitely necessary. As you can see, not much comes out, and then every now and then a lot come out. It throws it obviously in a circular motion, just like the old Versalab does, which makes sense, obviously. And the faster RPM, the more wide throwing, whoops, the more wide the throw is of the grounds. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and stop this once we hear it kind of stop and it stops kind of flowing. All right, once it's done, I'm gonna turn it off. There we go, 41 seconds roughly. Do you see all that fall out? Do you see that? I'll go ahead and scoop it all up so we can see how much of that 20 gram dose came out. I've read some people who have this grinder, what they like to do is after every grind or after whenever they switch beans, they just pop the funnel off and brush out the burrs, which is probably a good thing to do in order to ensure no exchange. All right, that's probably good enough. 
we got out 17.6. And now you're asking, where's the other two and a half grams? I'll show you where it is. You ready? Watch closely. I'm gonna turn it back on and then watch. Boom, there it is. Now we're at 19.96. There we go. Now we're back to almost almost exactly zero retention. It does eventually all get out. You just kind of have to kind of jimmy it a bit. And then of course, like I said, you can blow and there's some fines I've spit out just to kind of get it all out. And there we had it in about 45, 50 seconds after you do the on, off, on, off. For fun, I did it at 200 RPM. It took over two minutes for the full grind. And then of course we had to hit on, off, on, off to get it all out. Never stalls. I've never had this stall. You can go cold start. You can do 200 RPM at the finest setting with the lightest roast and it will not stall. The question is, should I get this at 850 bucks? Well, you'd have to get over a lot of the workflow flaws. And I know a lot of you don't like the fact it's a battery. I absolutely love not having to have this plugged in. You can charge it once a month, maybe and then you can have you have it modular it can sit anywhere and it's so clean because there's nothing holding it to anything i love that actually but then you have to source lithium for batteries and well we know how that is is it a necessity i don't know they have a lot of videos on their youtube showing you how to change the burrs clean the burrs take things apart replace things etc so you have a great system behind it a great company behind it brandon and his sister are very responsive to emails so if you have any questions they'll be quick to respond at 850 bucks with the work flaws I'm personally willing to take a small step back uh, with and get like a DF64V or a Timor 064, or if I can squeeze the money, I'm going with a Zerno. This is kind of in a dead man's land right now because it has everything you want in the build, but the ergonomics are greatly lacking in my opinion. I do think it makes great coffee. If, for those of you wondering, I think switching burrs out is very easy and it does great jobs with those. It just takes a lot longer. The sound is nice. Um, it's very quiet. The, it, it's robust. And again, it, you know, and then I know the aesthetics are hit or miss. Some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, so I guess if it's up your alley, great. If it's not, well, you might wanna look elsewhere. I really don't like the dial system. I don't like the hopper. So like I said, it's all ergonomic based on things I don't like. Um, and then obviously it's not ideal the way that the grounds come out. It can get kind of messy. That's the Kopi Concepts 64. Uh, hopefully they'll make some iterations in the future that correct a lot of these issues. But this is their first try at a grinder uh, from a background in F1. So pretty cool. I'm just glad to see there's more people coming out with things that are not the same exact thing like like just different versions of the ek43 Kalita mill or or different versions of you know uh, the standard like horizontally set burrs this is uh definitely a different a different direction in grinders which i'm uh, is very welcomed it might be a great grinder for you let's move to the next one next up is a grinder you've probably not seen, though it's been around for over 20 years. This is the Olympia Mocha SD, single dosing grinder. This specific iteration has not been around 20 years, but the, the Mocha grinder has been around for that long from the Swiss-based company that is known for their Cremina lever machine that I have one from over 50 years ago, as well as a current one. They're an incredibly high quality company that puts out things that will last longer than your grandkids will live. When I found out about the existence of this, I needed to get my hands on it. It comes at a steep price though. 1,500 US dollars, not cheap. It needs to be able to absolutely crush it. Back in 2020, they made it smaller and made it single dose. So it's no longer with this ornate hopper on top. It has this single dose, very heavy, hopper. So what it does is it has a robust motor of about 300 watts. It runs at 1400 RPM. Keep in mind that they made this with their lever machine in mind. So that is a very important thing to note is they made this grinder with their lever machine in mind. So their lever machine with how small the basket is at 49 millimeters doesn't need super fine grounds in order to create nine bar of pressure. Whenever I started to use this for uh, 58 millimeter baskets, uh, that's where the issue started to come in. But we'll go ahead, take a look at the exterior, and then we'll go to the interior and then and we'll actually run it for some stuff. So first of all, a really odd decision they made is this tray on the bottom. It doesn't actually fit anything. It just kind of sits there on the table. It doesn't lock in or anything. So as you move the grinder, that thing moves and it's just, I don't know, it's really, I don't like that. The next peculiar uh, decision was this is their portafilter forks. Now it can move up and down by about a centimeter, maybe a little bit less. Uh, this is at the lowest setting. Their idea was this is so low to the ground, you won't need the top part in order for it to stick on. So you can just put the portafilter on and it can rest on the table. When I put my naked portafilter on here, it does an okay job, but it can vibrate as it's running, right? And it can kind of fall off. Now, if you're using something like a split shot, you have a bigger issue. 
it wants to just slide all the way out. So we'll put like a newer port filter on here. This is the canal. It weighs like 100 grams without the basket. So this doesn't even fit because the head is too big. Here's the Kamina port filter. We put this on. Very, it's just a very odd decision because even with their own port filter, it doesn't really, doesn't really work very well. Then of course we can take like the bottomless one that Gaboro makes. We can set it on, and it also doesn't really work with this. So it's a really odd choice. All right, so moving up, we have the actual the dosing funnel on top. So the way you take it out is you just kind of pull up and it comes on out. Now this is a really unique contraption. I mean, it weighs about 600 grams. It's very heavy. The lid itself weighs like 50 or 60 grams. This whole piece is just, it feels quality. The whole grinder kind of does. Um, it has a similar build to the Cremina lever machine in that these panels kind of pull off like that. This panel comes off the front in the same way that the Cremina does. Um, so they, I mean, as far as aesthetic choices, it's very much just a little brother to the lever machine itself. What's really unique is they have a system created so that the bottom of this opens up when you twist it. So you always have a pretty much a hot start. Of course, this starts to open. If you open it slowly, the bottom will open a bit. The beans will start to fall on uh, burrs that aren't moving. But as once this little piece down here opens out all the way, it triggers the on button and turns it on. You line it up with these two dots here. Then when you twist it, that center, that little metal piece on the bottom opens and allows the beans to come out. And on its way opening, it hits the activation switch inside. Now on the side here, you have the dialing knob. Now this I think they really missed the mark on. This dialing knob just has little circles to kind of tell you your grind size. You have the smallest circle on one end and then the circles get bigger and bigger and bigger till it's at its biggest. And you don't even have a full 360 degrees rotation for dialing. So it's a very, very small window of being able to move the burrs back and forth. Now the reason it's like this is because they have a little grub screw on the inside, but they made it very difficult to take the grub screw out because there's no head on it. Now of course you can just pull this top off. It's magnetic with these two little uh, pieces that fit inside the inner piece. And then you just unscrew the screw in the center, and then you can reposition this wherever you want in order to open up different parts of the grind size. It's a little ridiculous how difficult it is to get to the burrs. The viewpoint of a manufacturer, you don't really want people messing with your burrs uh, and with the system in general. And like, I get that, but also, or in 2023 and people are burr crazy. So the first things first, we have to take out these two mount screws up at the top funnel. Then after that, we're gonna flip the machine over. It's a bit of a pain after we get those first two screws out because now we have to go past the portafilter fork in order to get the next two screws. This removes the top panel. Of course, you can take the portafilter fork off, but that's yet another screw to faff around with. As you can see, it's really robustly built. There's a lot of metal in here and everything's housed really nicely, but Curiously, you have three sheets of metal, three metal plates at the top. Now we have access to the burr carrier itself. You can see this burr set is somewhat similar to the geometry of like the SSPHU, although it's not entirely. This is a 64 millimeter ditting burr set. Yes, you heard me right, ditting. Just like the 54 millimeter burrs in the Barazza Forte, which I love so dearly, this is just the big brother version of those. So there is a man named Tom Poland who, uh, who I referenced earlier. He made a review on this. It's a write-up that's really nice and I'll, I'll put in the ca caption below. He absolutely loves this grinder and says he can do not Nordic light roast coffees at espresso without an issue. That has not been the case for me. He loves this so much that he actually sold his EG1 and bought a second one of these. So two at 1500 bucks as opposed to like a three or $4,000 EG1. I wouldn't do that. I have not had his experience, but it's worth mentioning because that isn't a differing experience from my own. Now, when these burrs are touching, I have been able to just barely hit nine bar using a dark roast I pick up at the supermarket for like 12 seconds. So you have to go past the sound of burr chirping in order to get to nine bar even with darker roasted coffees with 58 millimeter portafilter. Of course, when I use this with my Carmina, I don't have to go to burr chirp because you can use much coarser grounds with those small portafilters because how narrow they are. The bigger portafilters, it takes a bit more fine grinds. So we're gonna go straight at burr touch. So we're gonna go just off burr touch, and here we go. So that's what it sounds like when grinding, and this is what it looks like. So you can actually hear how coarse this is. It feels like a powdery sand. We're gonna hit it on and use the bellows and see if we get anything else out. Here we go. So 
So there is still a decent amount in there, as you can see from here. This is what all came out. Let's see what this weighs. That was 0.6 grams that I was able to get out with the bellows. All right, now this is from the DF64V and it actually fits perfect in here for any of you that may have this. It's not quite fine enough to hold your fingerprint. It's not quite fine enough, even with a darker roasted coffee to hit nine bar. But obviously if you go much further past chirp, so we're barely at chirp, we go further. So you can keep going. Let's see how far I go till burlock. So pretty good distance until burlock. It, you can get nine bar at Nordic light going way past burr chirp, but that's a little scary. Now on the EG1, for instance, there are little swipers on the side that are causing a faux burr chirp sound. It's not actually your burr chirping, so you go past that sound. I have opened this burr chamber though, and there's nothing that should be hitting causing that sound other than the burrs touching. And using the marker test, there's too many screws to open and do that I just did not feel like doing it. Maybe this is just a funky unit or something like that, but all I know is um, while the burrs are fantastic and make beautiful coffees, it's not great whenever you're not wanting to have to hear that awful sound. See, that's normal. That's the nine bar territory. Normal, nine bar territory for 58s. They built this grinder geared towards their Cremina lever. So obviously that coarseness and fineness, et cetera, is perfect for that and it makes splendid shots. You're giving up a lot of ergonomics, you're getting up a lot of workflow, you're giving up a lot of range with this dial. Now I, I've read that they are currently trying to implement numbers on the dial as opposed to these little dots, which will be a great thing. I love the compactness of it, I love this dosing, I love it. I think it looks kind of like a choo-choo train a bit, like with the little doo doo, little doo doo. I think it's pretty ingenious how you have to open it and then it opens the shutter, allows the beans to fall, so you virtually always have a hot start. Moke SD, let's move on to the last three. Here we go again on my own. Hugo loves when I do that. I have all these three here out at once because guess what? I have a video for this one, the Zerno right here, but I also have uh, an old video on this. I'll go ahead and link that one, I guess, but this is the Gen 2. So down below, I'll put a video by my buddy Kyle Rosell on the Gen 2 fellow Ode, and then the, the Time More 064S. Guess what? I have a video on the Time Mores right there. That This is 450 US dollars. This is 330 US dollars, and this sits around 1,400 US dollars. So one of the more pricey ones, the second most pricey on our table today. This one has that incredible little fines collector that I love. I use it to remove chaff and pour overs. I just grind my coffee, no RDT, and then I discard anything that comes off when I'm twisting this, this little nozzle right here. It's variable RPM with the, with the knob on the back. It goes from 800 to 1200 RPM. It's got a 180 brushless DC motor, which is overkill for a machine like this. The controller's a little conservative, and so it does stall out at the lower RPM with certain coffees on espresso grind size. But overall, it's a fantastic deal at 450 US dollars, has a great stepless uh, grinding um, dial on it, uh, and has the magnetic top. Uh, I think it's an incredible, an incredible, incredible deal. One of the best deals on the market today because it can do both filter and espresso. It also can house any of the different burrs. Uh, Time War's been very intense on recommending against doing that, but that's more so to save their own behinds if you, know, you put in something else and then it messes up. They don't want to be liable for that, and that makes sense. But switching out burrs is not that difficult just make sure you're careful with it in order to not mess anything up because they do have a pretty decent alignment system in here as well as a, a, a bean auger which I really really like. One of the things that might edge this over the DF64V is the fact that it is auger fed which I do really like and the vertically mounted burrs as well as the fines collector are big deals for me. Um, I sort of prefer the look I think of the DF64V but um, I think overall to save 140 bucks I'd probably go with this between those two. The O2 can only do filter as is well known it's a great companion grinder. Uh, at the new price point though, it's a little less savory as it used to be, because now you can buy something like the DF64E at 325 US dollars, which is about the same price as this, and you can just calibrate it to only filter coffee. And then you have a better built grinder that feels more sturdy, and it has stepless grinding, whereas this one is pretty big steps. Um, so while the fellow Ode, I think, definitely wins in the aesthetic category, as far as everything else, I might do the DF64E or P, but uh, this does have the ion generator inside, which uh, this one is, a, is getting on future uh, iterations, and I believe the DFs are as well in order to lessen the static there, which is a great thing that this has. Then we get to the 
the big boy, my favorite 64 millimeter grinder on the market. I have played with a Lagome P64. I have not really gotten to touch even or even seen in person the Akaya Orbit, but from what I have read on all the forums I've looked at um, is the people who have been able to have both this and the P64 have preferred the Zerno in every instance I've seen. If you have a different example, please let me know below. But what I see typically is this has a marginally better alignment out of box. The people are preferring the, the auger system and the fact that you can have variable augers to feed the beans at different rates to your burr set. And the fact that the augers are built to a tolerance so they're actually acting as pre-breakers is a big thing. So people have done side-by-sides of the P64 and the Zerno using the same burr sets and have been choosing the Zerno out of those. As far as the Akaya Orbit goes, I've just not heard nearly as much um, intense love for that grinder as I have for the P64 and the Zerno. And so I have seen some people get them and then return them and decide to keep the P64 or something like that once it came out. So I can't really speak about direct comparisons to that and this. Um, I can't really speak about direct P64 to this. I've only gotten to use a P64 and not actually keep one. But I am a sucker for vertically mounted, mounted burrs and the idea of playing with variable auger rates is absolutely fantastic. I also think it looks much better in my opinion. Um, I just, I, I really like this grinder and I think what the owner Vell is doing is really cool and more companies should Im mimic this, but he is very active in online forums and is taking feedback in how he evolves in his design. So some of these different things are coming about because of user input, which I think is fantastic. Normally it's impossible to get your opinions across to manufacturer. Vell is getting his own hands dirty as the, as the creator of this grinder in these groups, listening to feedback and I think that's awesome. He actually asked me to be an advisor to this, but I declined and pushed him towards these groups and he listened and he is now very deep in there and he talks about updates there on Espresso Aficionado Discord. This overall is just without question my favorite 64 millimeter. So if you're looking to ball out and you wanna spend over a grand for it, which is a very small percentage of you, of course, this is the way to go. If you're looking for an all-arounder at a budget, I really like the Time War 064S. I also like the DF64V. I think the V is really great um, and I think it kind of depends on your aesthetic preference because I think as far as their execution, they'll be quite similar. Yeah, there we go for my Magnum Opus on 64 millimeter grinders. I know that new grinders come out every other week and I figured now was a better time than any to go ahead and release this melee of uh, thoughts. I know that in two months this will be uh, an outdated video and that's absolutely fine. I hope that for years to come people can find something useful in this video. I didn't want to have to make a single review on all of these and just completely, you know, beg for views on all these different videos. So I just put it all in one and I hope that you appreciated it. And if you did, show their support by hitting the like and the subscribe. It means the world. It helps me so much. Thank you so much. I hope that you all brew something tasty today and cheers.